Okay, so as you know, my name is George Gollin. I've been um, uh, in Illinois for 25 years. We, my wife and I moved here when our daughter was a baby, and I've been teaching uh, physics at the university and doing research in elementary particle physics really ever since. I think the teaching part in some ways is the best part of the gig that I've got. Um, what what uh, began about 10 years ago is I started to do some higher education policy and that got me to see what a mess things are. Public interest legislation, uh, things that were meant to suppress the sale of fake medical degrees would get trashed because of dirty money flowing into the system. That was a hard collision I actually had with how we do, um, we do policy in the U.S. So a while ago, I started to think about how it wasn't working just to do policy as a person who did higher ed policy on the side and perhaps I should stand for office because um, there's nothing like being in Congress to be able to protect legislation that is in the public interest. So I'm, I'm at a good point in my life, my career, where um, I think I, it was the right thing for me to do to run. I think we, we've always had, all of us, just as, as human beings, concerns for fairness and justice. And we all, I think, have an obligation to promote more of that in civil society. And we're seeing a lot less of that, especially in the way we govern now. And it felt like this was something that I could try to rise to, to help, help bring about. What is your status as a uh, professor now? Are you teaching this year? I am on, I am on uh, unpaid leave from the university so that I can run, I can run for office means I get to do this nonstop now. I don't have, except there are letters of recommendation and things like that that I, I write for students who are applying to grad schools. But other than that, I'm largely away from the university right now. Are, are you doing a lot of door-to-door -door, uh, meeting people right mm -hmm. now? What mm -hmm. are you hearing? Um, I'm hearing, and it's interesting, uh, it doesn't matter whether someone self-identifies as conservative or, uh, or liberal. A lot of people are very concerned about economic issues, about job, uh, job loss, um, and so there's a lot of fear out there. I'm um, hearing that. The, um, the, the anger that people have towards the way Congress functions or doesn't function is, is, quite, is, quite, is quite pronounced also. Um, and I'm, I'm hearing this as we get around a lot. I was hearing this at county fairs during the summer in rural parts of the district. I hear this, the fear of, of job loss in, in union meetings. I, I hear this uh, in, in African American churches. Everybody's worried about, uh, about job loss. And what would be your ideas to improve the job situation or get people jobs back or have them not lose more? Okay, so um, there, I could like talk all day about oh, that. Like, okay, but we have never 45 ask a minutes. Professor, an open question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we need to hit things from from several many different directions, and we need to do some things that are fast that don't need legislative uh, legislative action. It's very hard to pass legislation. It takes about six and a half years typically to get a bill through through Congress. But we also do need legislation. So we need to, uh, in general, we need to really commit to, to fair trade, fair taxes, uh, uh, enforcement of the laws that allow people to unionize, uh, to protect their jobs. We, uh, now in times when it's not expensive for the government to borrow money, it's a very good time to fix the things that we have to fix anyway. So I think we should be investing very heavily in infrastructure rebuilding. It's, and it's not just roads, bridges, and physical infrastructure like that. We've got, we've got fairly pressing needs of bringing, I think, internet access uh, to everybody. I know that in rural parts of the district, sometimes it's very expensive. But my wife's cousin's farm um, in Iowa and being able to see what's going on in the world has always been very, very important for them economically. So one thing is investment in infrastructure. Another thing that perhaps can be made to happen fast is to uh, allow people to become eligible for a wider range of jobs. Uh, that often means uh, making sure that we are going forward with training programs. But also, we now know something more about how, why it is that people, for example, in Champaign County, 
don't finish their first degree. About 25 percent of the adults have some college, no, uh, but no, uh, no, they didn't finish the degree. And most of them, according to the president of Parkland, uh, stopped because they couldn't pass the math required to get an associate's degree. There's been a very good information out of a couple of Tennessee community colleges on how to fix that. It's, it's remarkably promising. So I think that we should start pushing pilot programs to allow people to finish their first degree out there as vigorously as we can. In my experience on some higher ed stuff and some physics stuff, the, the various offices in the executive branch, Department of Education, Department of Energy, they're very, uh, let's say, uh, willing to respond to pressure from legislators to do good things. So uh, trying to, to pilot program these, let's finish your first degree programs, is another thing. Does that mean more jobs. training in math to, so that everybody can do it? Or does that mean doing away with the math requirements? So no, no, no. I don't think we want to dumb down the schooling. Here's what, here's what worked in Tennessee. Uh, two community colleges put into some, a couple of high schools a what they call a concurrent enrollment program where they found just the right mix of self-paced and instructor-mediated work, which allowed 84% of a cohort of 200 students to, um, uh, to succeed. And success was defined as going through the entire uh, Associate of Arts math sequence. And a quarter of these kids then took some more math after they got out. So, uh, I mean, the numbers like that are astonishing. I don't think there'd ever been anything until this came out that was as promising as that. So I would think we would want to get the, the community colleges and the high schools and my office, my staff, to work up a, a program for a thousand student pilot program and then deploy it into the high schools, some of the high schools in the district. And you mentioned on infrastructure that it's a, it, it's a low interest rate time, so that means, I mean, we're already, you know, how many seventeen trillion dollars in debt on the federal government? Are you talking about borrowing more money to do the roads and bridges and internet? Yeah, if you need a car to get to work and you mm -hmm. have to take out a loan and you find that oh, there's a like a, basically a no a low, very low interest loan, you get a car to go back to work. So yes, um, we need. And how do you pay that off then? Um, take a look at the back to work budget from the Congressional Progressive Caucus. That uh, that budget is based on data. It's a pretty good budget. Uh, had a nice discussion with an economist who liked it, for example. Um, that uh, aims at reducing the unemployment rate to about 4.5% in the first two years. And then after that, begins to <clears throat> put more emphasis on deficit reduction and debt. And do you know how reduction. much would be borrowed, or you know, what would be the amount that you need to spend on the infrastructure program? I don't have that number okay. off the top of my head. And who well, runs hold the on, hold on, one more thing. I, sure. think to, I think to fix... For example, bridges nationwide, I think it's sort of like 10% of them need, need fixing. The number I remember, but I don't know that this is accurate, is sort of like, it seems low. Uh, I think it was $75 billion. It, it must be more than that. Uh, it's quite a lot. It's yeah. quite a lot to, to rebuild infrastructure. Okay. And who's a key person on the Congressional Pro Pro Progressive Caucus, or do you know? Well, Ra um, Raul Grijalva is the, is the head of it, but this was vetted, the budget was vetted by something called the Economic Policy Institute, which is a, a progressive okay. economics think tank. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what, how do we address the cost of higher education? For oh, members? such a good question. I think, I think the most pressing uh, strategy to try to establish is to make sure that there is a path that is, that is affordable, that is as inexpensive as possible. It's a big problem. It's the total amount of student debt is, is about $1.2 trillion now. Um, and I think we're, we're projecting people out into the world who are, in effect, uh, crippled in the range of choices that they can go for. Uh, so what do we, what do we start uh, doing? Again, we've got to hit this from many different sides. I think one uh, one thing to put the strongest focus on is to make sure that that we are able to have a student graduate from high school, go to a community college for two years, and then go to a four-year school to finish a bachelor's degree. I know there's increasing attention to this, even in research universities like mine, but it needs to be brought. The issues of alignment need to be strengthened. But but really, we're talking about cost. So what, what do we do? Um, the... Uh, the accreditors, I was on the board of directors of the Council for Higher Education Accreditation for six years, so I kind of 
this is a natural thing for me to think about. The accreditors, in my experience, are very, very susceptible to pressure from the Department of Energy, uh, Department of Education, both DOE, my funding comes from the Department of Education, from the Department of Education and also from um, the congressional folks who are on the, the um, it's called the Siki, the thing that oversees them. So I think that part of the decision of whether a university stays accredited or not should include a very strong consideration of their, uh, their moving forward on identifying their costs, on justifying their costs, and on trying to reduce their costs by focusing more on their mission, not, not putting quite as much into uh, the kinds of uh, frippery that attract students because of super nice dorms, but on what their costs are. I think what's most promising for something that can happen fast, because the universities, it's like, it's like herding cats that don't want to go there, you know. Um, what, what is very interesting is to see some discussions on ways to separate the question of what the cost is from what the student load, uh, load of debt is. And there are some problems with this approach, but it's interesting to see if it can be tuned. What's happening in Oregon now is that the state is rolling out a program in which a student can agree to pay a certain percentage, I think it's 10% of their income for 25 years, and that pays for what it costs to go to a state of Oregon school. That means that a, a student, like my daughter is in a master social work program at Penn right now, a student who is not gonna make a lot of money, social workers don't get paid that well, will have less money that they pay to the University of Oregon than someone who goes to a school, becomes, say, a, a neurosurgeon. There are some weaknesses here. There's nothing built into the naive rollout plan that, that forces the schools to reduce their costs. Also, there's nothing in there that will prevent them from biasing their admissions to selecting students who they think will, will pursue high high-paying high professions, but these are fixable things. Other possibilities, I think it's very interesting to consider identifying certain kinds of majors or professional paths, for example, for an MD, and, and working out how to have a community that is underserved. For example, Northwest Iowa, I think it's hard to find medical care there compared to elsewhere in the state where my, my, my relatives live. Um, create a program in which a region that needs more, more physicians can pay for the cost of uh, the physician's education with, in return, the physician works there for a subsistence salary for five years, say. There are starting to be more and more ideas as pressure on the whole system is brought to bear to, discuss, uh, to deal with the, uh, the question of cost. Just one really quick thing on that Oregon plan. Would that be 10% of your projected pay in that field or 10% of your actual pay in that field? Year to year, because I think, year I'm, year I'm, guessing, yeah, I'm guessing that you establish what it is that your income is through your, your federal tax filings. Okay. okay. Um, you are, I mean, health care is obviously a big issue, and you are hoping for movement to a single payer system. That's is that right. correct? Can you That's just right. explain that process and reason? Are you, okay. Um, like, I think you, know, you asked two questions. Are you asking what the process would be to it, or, or why? Why? Why, why you like it? And okay. I mean, the other part of that could be, you know, there's a lot of people, Rodney Davis for one, who says Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, is causing all kinds of problems. So many businesses say it's costing them too much. People cannot keep their insurance if they like their insurance. So, you know, is the current system good, and how do you get to the one you want? Okay, let's break this into two pieces. Sure. One is that the rollout was just completely unacceptably poorly done. Um, but that's, that's a matter of, of poor technology management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, we fix things. We don't walk away from problems. We, we fix them. And so, gosh, I, I think it was astonishingly terrible the way it happened. But that's, that's a matter of, of the technical tools needed to make information technology stuff work. That's entirely separate from, uh, from the benefits of having a population in which there is health care available. Now, I don't, uh, I don't see that we need to have the insurance industry peeling off 30% of the money flowing into the system. I think that's the number uh, to support their efforts. I like very much car insurance, homeowners insurance, but I don't see that we need to have the insurance industry involved in this. Single payer gets the insurance industry out of this business and the money, the money is much more effectively and efficiently handled um, by, for example, Medicare, Medicaid, they work a lot better than that. Now, uh, the, the concern of small businesses 
in terms of how they have to start paying some of the costs of the insurance is really significant. We see in the higher ed sphere, we see schools that have contingent faculty, have adjuncts, dropping the number of contact hours they're letting their faculty have in order to avoid having to pay them health insurance. The university is supposed to be pretty enlightened, and that's just, that's just really, really a terrible thing to see. Great thing about single payer is that it completely uh, separates someone's employment status from their, their, uh, the fact of, of their health care coverage. Someone wants to stop working for a major employer, a big business, to open a restaurant, to make a gizmo of a certain kind, wants to do some entrepreneurial thing. They don't have to think about what happens to their health insurance. That's a very, very good thing. We want to encourage innovation. So that's one of the many benefits of single payer. Go ahead. People who worry about single payer worry about the cost and how to bear that cost, and will it be more or less for the average person? And access, you know, people mm -hmm. having to wait for elective surgery, etc. So, mm -hmm. in and you know, obviously, you hear a lot on the right. This is you know, socialized medicine and that kind of thing. So, how do you move America there, and what will be the costs, and the will there be any negative, um, you know, things that happen to the quality of health care? I think it's good to compare um, Canada's system, which is a single-payer system with ours. There's this great, uh, highly informative film called uh, The Healthcare Movie, which compares the two. Um, the wait for elective surgery of certain kinds uh, is longer in Canada than it is if you're able to cough up the money for a plastic surgeon in the U.S., but the wait for, uh, for care that's, that's necessary as opposed to elective is, is very, very short. And um, the, the number of bankruptcies in the United States associated with catastrophic medical crises is, is astonishingly high. That, that is just not happening in Canada. Um, in terms of, uh, of, of um, the quality of care, um, and this surprised me a little bit, the physician community in Canada is delighted with how it's going. I think they, among other things, their decisions on what to do in treating a patient are based on their sense of the medicine that's appropriate rather than looking to see whether the insurance company will cover it or not, just in terms of, of discussing whether I'll have some, some tests done or not done where I go to, to get, uh, get taken care of. That always involves will the insurance company pay for it or not. So I think... Uh, now, please, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, politically, Dr. Gill, who ran against Rodney Davis last time, ran on basically a single-payer system, you know, uh, Medicare for all or whatever, um, and ended up losing in a district that might tilt slightly Democratic to Rodney Davis. So how, how could you change that dynamic? I think I know not to say I, I would, it would, we will see an end to Medicare as we know it. I believe that was used in some attack ads that was meant to. Yeah, well, that was that. just part of what he said, but you know how campaigns it was, become. That was unwise. I think what we're seeing that's really different is the system is in place now, and the enrollment is, um, is below, but not by much, the target expectations, the target aspirations of the government. And so I think what's going to happen is that this will fairly rapidly become like Social Security. It's something people count on. They view it as a good thing. And the, the hostility towards it will, will abate. People will start to realize that, oh, my gosh, this terrible thing has happened to me, and I, I'm able to get treated for it. Whether the costs go up or, or down depends on the, on the details, and the devil is in the details. I remember, uh, I think New York State was somewhat earlier in getting their, their system up and running than ours, and to the surprise of many people in the system, they were finding they could get uh, coverage that was at least, at least as good for about 50% less. Okay, when you say the hostility will abate, you mean to just the Obamacare? The idea of now. Obamacare, right. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, nonsense that's being said, and people are... Are, are angry at, at, uh, at the government and are receptive to something that's misleading and not really not based in fact. Food stamp cuts, was that a good move? Oh, no. no. The votes I, today, right? Whoa. I, I take a shift Friday mornings at a soup kitchen in Champaign, and I've been doing this for about a year, and I, I did not appreciate how rough it is. I mean, intellectually... I know this, right? I'm, I'm a person who, who knows facts and knows numbers. But, but I would be out front serving people, and I would see mom with a couple little kids. 
and, and they're on food stamps, and they need us at the Daily Bread Soup Kitchen to keep from starving. Holy cow. And these are, these are not people who are coasting. These are folks who are scared. They're putting tremendous energy into maintaining their self-respect, and they are very, very much in, in danger of, of, of having to choose between food, being able to feed themselves, being able to, to pay for electricity, being able to pay the rent. I met, I met a family at a, at a county fair, rural folks. Uh, the mom and dad were, were on, uh, in minimum wage jobs. They had food stamps. And they told me that the way they prioritized things was first they'd pay their electric bill. Second, they'd pay their water bill because if, you, if you, your water got cut off, you could always find clean water in town. Then would be rent, then would be food. You can always live in your car. Then would be, uh, well, forget medical care. So people are really hurting. It's not that they're using this in an abusive way, but they're really hurting. And, and I think that restructuring other parts of the farm bill would have been a much more appropriate way to, to find those savings than cutting food stamps. So think, you, would, you would have voted against the bill that passed the House last week? Um, I'd have to look at the whole bill, but my, my first reaction is, yeah, I would vote against it because the food stamps, I, I would propose all sorts of uh, adjustments to how we calculate uh, some of the, how we handle, um, oh, well, the direct payments have gone, uh, how farm insurance is handled, for example, and other things like that. I would try to make it, make the, the, uh, the farm bill protect single family owned farms like my wife's relatives have. And, uh, and protect people's ability to have access to food. But would you lower kind of the insurance benefits that quote unquote corporate farms have? Is that what you're saying? That's a, that's a good thing to consider. We wanted to protect folks, but you know, because you, you know this, this watchdog stuff that's on my business card, I, I turned into rather more of, a, of a, a person paying attention to enforcement than I had been before. And, uh, and, and my, again, my wife's Relatives will comment on how people they know they think are growing crops, claiming to grow crops on land that's not not suitable for farming, marshy marshy areas and things like that, and then claiming uh, claiming that the, the the land underperformed. I think trying to stop things like that will will uh, avail us of some savings. So I think if we can if we can increase our ability to to make people follow the rules, that will also, well, that will now, also provide that, savings. that bill took a long time. So how, how are you going to work in such a partisan environment in mm -hmm. Washington? You know, how are you going to work with Republicans? Or where, where, where yeah. can you have, because nothing's getting done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> so give us a way that you can okay. prove that. So you, you started the question with a reference to what's really a heavy lift takes the whole Congress, the farm bill. Let me talk about more, just more generally. I think that what, uh, what, should work, and it's based on something that I, I had worked on some years ago and something I'd like to do in the future, is to try to find potential allies across the aisle for very, very specific legislative uh, actions. An example in the past was what I worked on with, um, uh, okay, Betty McCollum, Minnesota 4th District from St. Paul, basically, and a little bit more than that. Tim Bishop. Uh, has the New York First District. He is, um, which is lo Eastern Long Island. Raul Grijalva in Arizona was in on this too. They they got interested in writing legislation to try to suppress the sale of fake academic degrees, and I got brought in to help with that. It was it was a great experience. But the way they they made that bill known, their intentions known to the rest of the Congress was through a dear colleague letter that went out to everybody. So here is a proposed piece of good government legislation. At the state level, there had been, there had been uh, legislation to suppress degree mills written by conservatives, by, by liberals, didn't matter. But the way this was presented to the con whole Congress was as an initiative produced by three um, progressive to center-left Democrats. It immediately labeled what was just good government uh, as, a, as a progressive initiative. The people that I helped the feds in prison were based in Spokane, Kathy McMorris Rogers District. She's very conservative. You you know who she is. I she, she the one that just spoke. She just gave yes, yeah, she, she was she was the response. she was the front person for the for an amendment to weaken the Violence Against Women Act. But McMorris Rogers knew knew of the investigation happening in her district and I, I it's a complicated, interesting story, but I, I had communicated through 
a university president with her office to see if she would co-sponsor the bill. She said she could not, basically because of the political perils, but when, when the Higher Ed Act, which included this legislation, passed the House, she spoke, she's on the Congressional Register speaking in favor of it. So a way to have done it differently would have been for, say, McCollum and Bishop to quietly approach McMorris Rogers and also, I think, Thomas Petrie, conservative member of Congress in Wisconsin, whose wife is a higher education policy expert, that's what she does, and to see if they would like to produce something that could be identified as fully bipartisan, we're going to stop people from selling fake medical degrees and bring it into the world that way. Uh, so I, I'm, I think that finding in specific issues someone on the other side of the aisle, a few members of Congress, approaching them before anyone hears about this to see a way to bring something into the world that everybody really is going to agree is good might be a way to, to reduce the partisan troubles that it has. In the future, um, there's a, a technique for rendering much safer radioactive waste from spent fuel that also produces energy. It's got a complicated name. Uh, I, you know, I'll put you to sleep if I talk about the details of it. But what it, it takes to do this, and it could completely revolutionize how we generate nuclear energy in the US, is a, is a proton accelerator similar to something that's the first about 150 feet of something being developed at Fermilab west of Chicago. Uh, Randy Hultgren is a representative who has Fermilab in his district. He's very supportive of national laboratories as great things, not just because of jobs, but because of the, the intellectual power they bring into the United States. So I would love for us to be able to pressure the Department of Energy to let us go forward on developing the technology for the front end of this power generation system at Fermilab and at the Argonne National Laboratories to build a pilot transmutation facility here in Clinton, say, where the power, the power plant is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This would, be, this would involve making an approach to Mr. Hulgren, Bill Foster, who actually tried to hire 30 years ago at the physicist, and, and then the representatives who have the research universities in their district, the governor's office, the rest of the Illinois delegation. So I think something like this has, and there are tons of jobs, there's so much money that would go into producing these things. We could sell them to China and India. It's a billion dollars a shot, the world market's a few hundred of these things. But it might be that something like this is just good for everybody, also would generate enough interest on both sides of the aisle so we could go forward with it. So I would try things like that. Find a specific thing. Find possible interested parties, uh, interested members of Congress, both sides, and then see if we can quietly talk about how to go forward with this to avoid some of the politics. Just to clarify that point, is, is this using spent nuclear fuel to generate power, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's amazing. Okay. Yeah, and, it's amazing. And do you call it anything in particular? Is there a name for this? Um, I, I guess radioactive waste from spent fuel, when you, when you get rid of all of that, what happens is it, the hot stuff needs about 60,000 years to cool off. What happens after you, you blast it this way is it takes about 600 years to cool off. So it's still, it's still dangerous stuff, but it's likely that we will still have a civilization that can recognize And it would be able to generate energy on the side. Generates a lot okay. of energy okay. on the side. Do you um, have any opinions on uh, Fukushima and how whether the U.S. should have been more involved in to clean that up. I mean, that seems to be in your... It seems really house. dumb to put something where it could get clobbered by a tidal wave. Um, you know, I, the, the placement of, of, of facilities where if they get clobbered by a, a massive natural disaster, uh, the placement has to include, you know, one in a thousand year scenarios, and they, should, they shouldn't have put it there. Uh, there are other, other things that were badly flawed. I'm not an expert on Fukushima, okay, but... but some of the, the, the major problems are caused by the inability to provide electricity to pump, to keep things from, cool, uh, from heating up too much just from natural radioactivity. And that was not handled properly but, or designed properly. But I'm not an expert on that. Okay? Is the U.S. taking care of its, its nuclear facilities properly, in your opinion? Um, let's see. What do I think? Our, our reactor designs are generally pretty good compared to Chernobyl. Um, I, I don't know how vigorously enforced the regulatory oversight is. I hope it's good. We haven't had anybody die from nuclear stuff, but it's always been something that really worries me a lot. But I don't, I don't, I don't know, since our nuclear infra infrastructure is aging, I don't know in times of, of budget cuts whether the regulators have enough muscle to be doing the job that we would like them to be doing. 
Do you have a view on the, immigra on the Immigration Dream Act, pathway to citizenship, obviously a volatile issue? Sure. Um, I think with a lot of uh, policy that we might go forward with, we need to keep an eye on what happens to families. I think we have to go into a discussion of immigration um, with a very large amount of concern for whether we're, we're busting up families, okay? Deporting parents when the kids were born here or came here at a very young age is a terrible thing. And that's been interesting for me to learn that um, in the immigrant, in the, I assume, also the undocumented community, the, the major concern is really just to be able to be here legally and then matters of, of what does it take to become a citizen, those are quite secondary. I had not appreciated how how the, the immediate concerns of being able to come out from the shadows was so, so, so important. I think there should be a path to citizenship, but I think what we want is to get people out of the shadows as soon as possible. And there are lots of good reasons for that, um, including that you know, people have, have basic human rights because they're, because they're, they're human beings, not because they're citizens. And one of the rights is to be uh, protected from predation by employers. And I think the abuses that undocumented folks have at the hands of employers is, is, uh, is completely unacceptable. So if they came here illegally any number of years ago, two, three, five, then why is it fair or how do you get it done to bring them out of the shadows and give them legal status? Fair, fair is, an interesting, is an interesting metric to put on that, okay? Um, they're here, they're working. As I understand it, the data show that the family structure is, is rather stronger. And even, there was a, something written by an epidemiologist my wife showed me a couple of days ago, even matters of what's the, what is the life expectancy at birth of the Hispanic population, even if they're maybe not here legally, is, is a couple of years greater than for white non-Hispanic residents. I was, I was surprised by that. Um, so fairness, uh, to whom is it unfair? Uh, I think the, I think the, the uh, an important violation to consider is that employers are not supposed to be hiring these people who are here as undocumented. And so concerns about a worker having his or her job uh, displaced by someone who's undocumented, well, the employer should never have hired that undocumented person. I think, um, I think we like to be able to have people in, uh, in who become legal who are in jobs that can be um, uh, allow them to, put, to participate in unions should be should be able to should be allowed and welcome to strengthen the unions. But I think the unfairness we should really tag the employers who hire people who are undocumented because they're not supposed to do that. You've said a couple times now in, improve the access to union membership or mm -hmm. how, what are you talking about? Are you talking about you on card check as the unions were going for a couple years ago or what? I think we like basically the uh, the intent of the National Labor Relations Act to be enforced. I'm glad that the NLR, NLRB finally has full membership, but it took recess appointments by, by President Obama to, to fill that. I would like there to be more, more enforcement, legal enforcement staff who could bring injunctions against employers who are acting illegally to suppress unions. Union membership's way down now, and I think that one of the long-term crises we face is how to keep our country viable, how to return our economy to something approaching full employment. Um, in the face of such large and, and rapidly increasing income inequality. And I think the unions in times past, before basically around the time when Reagan fired the air traffic controllers, the unions were one of the, the important bulwarks against rising income inequality. Productivity would go up, profitability would go up, and salaries of folks in unionized labor would go up, and then that stopped 1979, 1980, coincident with the firing of the uh, air traffic controllers. Um, about income inequality, uh, minimum wage, president's called what for, what can you say, at least $10.10? Ten 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 what where are you on this? Um, I think it should be a livable wage. I think it's just part of our, basically our rights as humans. It's the stuff that's in the United Nations Declar Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You should be able to, to feed yourself and your family and pay your rent if you're working 40-something hours a week. And um, so I am very, very supportive of what we call a minimum wage actually becoming a livable wage. Which would be a what level? It's going to depend on where you are. The current discussion is about $10.70. Uh, 
Um, I, I was out there freezing, wearing a suit. Suits, these are not such good things for really cold weather, but I was out there carrying a sign at a demonstration a for, anyway, a <laughs> for uh, $15 an hour. I, I, the, the economics is really interesting. The, the a concern, of course, is that employers pay more, they are able to hire fewer people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are some things that mitigate that, not fully, but, but are not so far off from fixing the problem. For one thing, turnover drops a lot. The, the, tre the, training, retra or the training expenses of, of reduced turnover um, that you save make up for some of that. Also, um, and, and in my own experience, I guess it's OK if I mention brand names, right? Because this is well, not, I'm OK. Freedom of speech. If, well, if, if, this, if this were broadcast, I would not want to. This will be on, our, on, our, on the internet. Okay, well, let me, let, me, let me not mention specific. It's up to you. Um, there was a national public radio story comparing um, Walmart with Costco, okay, with on NPR. Walmart employees are rather low paid. Many of them are said to be on food stamps. And so what we as a society uh, are doing is perhaps paying less for something at Walmart, but then we're paying a little bit more into our taxes to support the food stamp given to people who are not able to feed themselves on Walmart salaries. The Costco stock's been going up, up, and up, and up. The uh, uh, the Costco management has realized that the employees are not just there to stock the shelves, but they are part of the customer experience. They've increased their staffing. So what happens is that someone goes into Costco and has a good experience where an employee who is now better paid, better respected, actually is helpful and makes the customer feel pretty good about Costco. Uh, my experience with Best Buy, I buy a lot of electronics, consumer stuff, you know, computers, things from my lab. Some years ago, Best Buy was, was minimally staffed. The staff didn't really know that much about the products, and I found it to be pretty frustrating buying things there. Now I go into Best Buy, someone comes over, says, uh, so tell me, uh, how can I help you? They'll take me over to where something is, they know the products, and I feel really good about Best Buy. Best Buy, I think, was considering bankruptcy or reorganization some years ago, and they've, they've seemed to have understood that, that uh, treating their employees well, paying them decently, um, contributes to their profitability. So there are things that, that go against the simple model that you pay your employees more, you can't hire as many. And closing Circuit Cities didn't hurt them. Um, <laughs> that was quite a while ago. Uh, politically speaking, um, there's a guy named David Green who arguably is, you know, more to the left than you on, on several issues, also from Champaign. And Ann Callis has uh, the, who stepped down as chief judge down in Madison mm -hmm. and the next <clears throat> county over, um, has support of Dick Durbin, the senator, support of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. So why are you better than her, and how do you overcome that political hurdle that she has the organizational support? OK, first about organizational support. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Gill, David Gill, was, did not have the backing of the Democratic organization, mm -hmm. and he won his primary. Rush Holt, he's the older of the two physicists currently in Congress. Uh, his district includes Princeton, Central New Jersey. He did. I, we overlapped for a year at Princeton. We were both in the faculty at the same time for a little bit. Uh, Holt, the first time he won a seat, beat a, a DCCC back candidate. I think it was 64 percent to 36 percent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so support from the organization um, is, uh, to my mind, is not the sort of factor that uh, people might might think it is. I have a great deal of respect for Senator Durbin. I worked actually with one of his staff for a while on some higher ed stuff. I really like his, his, his work to try to rein in the practices of the for-profit sector universities, and I really like the leadership he's taking on immigration. But, uh, and so we, we disagree on some things, but that's, but that's okay. I don't always agree with my wife on stuff. Now, you're, you're also asking about, I think, about uh, why if I'm there, I think you're trying to place me between David Green and Ann. I'm not sure. Well, I don't know. I'm not I don't sure. know what you think. What he asked percentage. why you're better for the job than Ann Callis. Well, my background is entirely different. Uh, I've been doing science and education all of my career. My professional experience is identifying 
complicated problems, working with other people to, to solve them. This is also really fun, working in the lab or figuring out how to redesign a course that's not working so well. There's real joy in that, and part of my, my attraction to what it might be like if I'm fortunate enough to, uh, to, to win my elections is that I'll get to kind of wade in there with a lot of things that are broken, uh, with um, lots of ideas about things to try or people to talk to to try to fix fix things that are broken. So it's real joy in in fixing things that need to be need to be improved. But one one last thing sure. though, you know, uh, I think the the some of the most important drivers for the economy are our education, how well we educate, how well we free the best and brightest up to, to innovate, how we manage science and technology. And we should be the best in the world by far doing this. This is the stuff that I've worked in all of my life. I'm full of things I'd like to try. I know how I would like to try to deal with the math remediation issues and so forth and so on. So my backgrounds are different. I, I work in things that, that do seem to translate into economic benefit, and I've been a problem solver because it's, it's really a pleasure for me all my, all my career. Yeah, I will <coughs> mention the AFL-CIO is another organization that is with NCALS. We've got about six weeks out here, and I don't know how it was when Congressman Holt ran, but the person on the street in Springfield doesn't know who Ann Callis or you or, or the, <coughs> Mr. Green are at this point. I mean, in order to win this primary, what do you do? Are you going to be advertising a lot? Are you, do you have enough door to door? I mean, where does this come from if, if the organizations that we know of are there and nobody's on TV or radio that I've heard or well, newspapers? It's, I, <laughs> I, I think, okay, so I, um, I think that the, the, uh, the media part of the campaign is, is approaching pretty soon, but we're still six weeks out. What's uh, important is to show up and to have a good ground game. And I keep showing up. I eat you know, pancakes at 8 in the morning, an hour and a half away from, away from Champagne. I have a great time talking to people. I discover an hour and a half from Champagne that the guy I used to buy uh, sushi rice from who ran a store in Champagne now lives, lives there. You've got to show up. You have to talk to people. Uh, I go to lots of union things. People get to ask me, ask me questions. Um, I was complaining about how cold you get in a suit when it's really cold outside, like in that $15 an hour thing. Um, I was knocking on doors in Springfield, uh, I guess it was two weeks ago, with one of with our, our uh, field guy there. And uh, showing up, knocking on doors is important. We've got a lot of volunteers doing this now. We're making lots and lots of phone calls. Any idea the number of volunteers you've got? Um, that would be something my, you know, my, my campaign manager would know. I mean, there's got... <laughs> um, we have, you know, probably a list of, of over a hundred, okay. and uh, you know, it's weekly. It depends on people's schedules, how many we are actively seeking out. But you're absolutely correct when you say that the people on the street in Springfield don't know who's running because that's what our phone data is showing. But a lot of times, our volunteers are calling people in Georgia as the first person that they've mm. heard. Of. So That's what we're hearing right, too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My mother is one of the volunteers. My mom lives in Champaign now, She's and so she calls people. people. <laughs> yeah. There's some uh, discussion about trying to get a debate going, among, and that hasn't happened yet, has it? Well, let's see. There's one February 20th. I I think we should have tons of debates. I think it's it's the obligation of the candidates to let the people in the district get a good hard look at them and hear them and ask them questions. The voters are who are supposed to pick the candidates. The voters should know what they're getting. It's, it's really what we have an obligation as people running for office to do. You know, we're, we're going to be doing a, um, um, a teleforum tonight, for example. We invited uh, Ms. Callis to participate in that. Did you invite Green, by the way? Did we, well, we know that David really, he, he loves to talk about stuff. And it's kind of fun, actually. Uh, to interact with him, but I, I don't know what the story of that is. He's been pretty successful yeah. at getting his, his views out. Okay, uh, Ann Callis did put out a release like a week ago saying that she's agreed to be in a champagne forum, a candidate forum in Champaign February 20th, and a League of Women Voters, uh, Madison County, March 6th, and just, just those two. I think the Madison County one, if I remember right, is more of a meet and greet. Yes. We want to have people okay. just ask us hard questions. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, there's, there's, it's also interesting. I mean, I like I like that kind of that kind of circumstance. It's like being in a classroom, right? I'm used to students asking me, "So, what makes you think that that's really true?" That's what we're supposed to be doing, and that's also something I I, I really have have a great deal of pleasure in doing. Could you? I'm going to 
give us a warning here. We're warning David. Okay. Can you assign a grade to the job that Romney Davis has done as congressman? What has he, and what has he maybe done well? What has he tripped up on? Just how do you assess the job that he's done? You're asking for a single, a single measure uh, estimation of the work he's done. I, I, I don't want to do something like that. It's like, how would I grade? I like to, I like, really like to cook. Okay, so there's a lot of food analogies. How would I rank a restaurant? I don't really do that. They're good at this and not good at that. I think Mr. Davis's votes, um, some of the ones that I, I concentrate on, are really have not been in the best interests of, of people in the district. He had voted to allow employers, for example, to compensate workers for overtime by giving them additional vacation days and specifying when those vacation days needed to be taken. People should be paid money. People should be paid money for, uh, for vacation. I'm sorry, for for overtime, he voted to he voted for an amendment to weaken the Violence Against Women Act. He's generally not supportive of uh, of the Affordable Care Act or the idea of really providing universal medical coverage. Um, I think his his policies generally are things that favor those who are already in positions of affluence, and that's that's not appropriate. A member of Congress is to represent the entire district and to fend off as best as possible. The, uh, the unfair influences of those who can make significant campaign contributions. And who is contributing to your campaign? A lot of physicists, a lot of yeah. educators, a lot of teachers. Yeah, um, I, uh, one of the first uh, Nobel laureates to endorse me was someone who invented the theory that describes what happens inside nuclei. And so after I pitched him, his name is David Politzer, after I pitched him for, for a donation, and he was a good guy, very generous. Then we talked about the thing that won him the Nobel Prize for a while. So lots of physicists. Um, Where does he live? Uh, he's uh, he's on the faculty at Caltech. Okay. So, you know, we we want things that a member of Congress does will have national impact as well as just for the district. And having uh, bringing an understanding of education and science and technology into into our governance is going to benefit everybody, not just, for example, if I'm successful, not just this district. So it makes a lot of sense that I would I would contact people who teach at universities, people who understand about science. So a lot of physicists. Um, you, you gave what? Like, did you put? Two, was it how many? How much did you put in your own campaign? Oh, it's so funny that this is a story. Yeah, I uh, first. Well, not everybody can do it, you know. <laughs> well, you know, okay. Um, no, it was, it was 165. My wife and I, we have always lived by taking as much right off the top so we never see it and putting it away. And that's how we save for retirement. That's how we, we paid for, for, for schooling for our daughter. So we live these, these safe, cautious, middle-class lives. And uh, I thought that if the pension system actually still exists when I retire someday, just our daughter would inherit this. But... This is a shot for me to try to fix things that are badly broken. And it felt like, you know, that's a lot of money for me, but it really felt like this was something that I should do. I have an obligation to, to call the police if there's, a, if there's an adult beating up a child in a shopping mall. Here, things are messed up, and our governance is uh, not addressing the problems. And I think I will be able to, to address this. So I put a bunch of money in, and it was a lot of money for me. 165. But yeah, but I had it because... Um, because I, I live cautiously, I'm not frivolous. We have one house, we don't have multiple houses, vacation homes. We spend money when it's appropriate to spend money. We don't, we don't do without, but you know, I don't, I don't spend money on things particularly. And this is your first run for office, yes? Or have you run before? Student council, no, I, I have not <laughs> stood for elected office before, but I've, I've done higher ed policy. Um, I was on the Council for Higher Education Accreditation Board for six years. It was a lot of working stuff on Capitol Hill. So I've, I've, I've done politics from the, from the policy side, from moving legislation, from trying to bring information together on the Hill.